everyone. Welcome to Live from Our Library, Books That Celebrate Back to School. I'm excited to be here with you today again, and I just want to remind you to put any questions that you have into the comments as we move through the book recommendations and we'll address them. And I think I mentioned this the first time that I did Live from Our Library, but since our theme today is Back to School, I wanted to remind you guys that I used to be a teacher as well as a public librarian, but my background in teaching is that I uh, did mostly 8th grade, but I taught 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade, as well as GED classes, and I did teach 4th grade briefly, so that's my background, and I'm certified in English, but I'm also certified in math, so um, those are some of the subjects I've taught. And today, the list that we put together for you, I think, is going to address the whole kind of a K-12 um, thing, and we're going to post the list for you on scholastic.com slash parents. It's going to be on the Raise a Reader blog. Um, I also wanted to start off by talking about some stuff from our Kids and Family Reading Report. We have some kind of five reading resolution ideas that we have for parents and children as they go into school. And so one, looking at our data, is just to remind you that choice and access are big things. So as you go back to school to try to keep books in the home, it'd be a great time to make a, you know, that first trip of the fall to the library, whether it's a public or school library. Um, ask your students, your child's teacher at back to school nights about what suggestions that they have for read alouds and activities, you know, books that the teachers read or would, you know, suggest for pleasure or for school. Um, to read aloud at home and keep it going. We talked about this, I think it was actually our first live from the library, we were talking about read aloud suggestions. So you could go all the way back to that one and also you know, look at some of the videos that we put up this summer. And remember that that can be more than just bedtime stories you can read aloud, you know, newspaper articles to your teenagers and share comics, all those kind of things. Uh, to be a reading role model, so as you settle into your um, he says, so your schedule or your rhythm for the school year, try to include time where your children can see that you're reading, whether you're reading together or they see you reading on your own. And just to remember the choice part, let kids pick books that they like um, as you're going through all of the different books that are available. So what we tried to do this time for suggestions was pull a book to represent each grade. And some of them I've read before, some of them I haven't. But I wanted to start off with, of course, so we've got the Clifford School Story Box. And this has, you know, six different Clifford stories in front of it. I should have brought my stuffed Clifford that I could have here on the table with me. And then I pulled this one, Jerry Spinelli's Star Girl. This is one of my favorite reads. Um, from when I first started as a teen librarian, the main character is just a kind of quirky, interesting young woman who doesn't let anybody's kind of judgments of the way that she carries herself get her down. She brings her banjo to school, plays music for folks on their birthdays and stuff like that. And she's just a really inspirational young character. So those are, that's my favorite that I have. And there are actually a couple of favorites that I mixed in here. So starting off with kind of uh, board books, really fine. Can you see that there? Yeah, board books and uh, early education. We have a couple interesting ones for the you know folks who are just starting off with going to school. So this one is a rookie reader. Three, two, one. School is fun. Right, it's kind of like a basic one that you can read as a nighttime story. And then also nursery rhymes, sing along. And this book has some links that you can go to where they have some of the audio for the different songs that are included here. Uh, this says this volume includes It's Raining, It's Pouring, The Itsy Bitsy Spider, and Mary Had a Little Lamb. And then one of the things we were thinking about is when you first start to leave home, it's a very little one, and go to nursery school, you may be doing potty training. So we pulled these two, um, Potty Hero and Potty Star by Jane Massey. Uh, it's just books that you can read as somebody's transitioning to um, practicing or you know being fully potty trained you know going into school or nursery school all right so that was the first section and then remember if you have any questions just put them down there any um you know 
ideas or a particular interest that your child has. I'm going to see if we can come up with some answers for you. Next one is kindergarten to second grade. I'm very excited about this. So the first one that I've got here, Planet Kindergarten. This is by Sue Gantz Schmidt, and it's illustrated by Shane Prigmore. Right, so space adventure for a kindergartner. And then for first grade, this is one of our new picture books. I really enjoy this book. It's called Wordplay by Adam Lerhept and illustrated by Jared Chapman. And the main character that you see here on the cover is a little girl. Each character in here is a part of speech. So I think this is very exciting. This is our first grade book. And so if somebody's learning what nouns and verbs and things like that are, this is a great book for that. And then the main character you see here, the verb, she's action, she likes to run, she likes to jump and do things like that. But then she gets challenged when all of a sudden the noun shows up on the playground and noun can be, a, you know, people, places and things. And so they eventually find a way to work together, of course, but this book is, you know, starts off, it's got the different parts of speech inside of it and it's got a great story and wonderful illustrations. So this just came out in the past couple of months. Very excited about that one. And then I snuck a favor in right here, Ramona and her father by Beverly Cleary. And in this particular one, there are several Ramona stories, as I'm sure many of you know. Um, they have them all listed here on the back. Um, Beezus and Ramona and Ramona Quimby, age eight. But this one I pulled because in this book, she's uh, in second grade. And the Ramona stories, to me, they just you know stand the test of time. And so we talked about choice, where you let um, your children pick the books that they're interested in, but if you want to share one of your favorites, then the Ramona stories are definitely good ones to go for. All right, now we are going to go to third, fourth, and fifth grade, and I misplaced my sign. So you remember last month that my intern made signs. I got to find that one. Hopefully, I didn't recycle it. The first one I've got for third grade is Third Grade Mermaid by Peter Raimundo. Right? And it's a little mermaid named Cora, and she's trying to figure out how to be like the, uh, the sirens, the swim team in the school. So that's our third grade book. And then I snuck in another personal favorite. Now this doesn't have the kind of classic cover that Ramona did, but many of you will recognize the title, Tales of a Fourth Grade Nothing by Judy Bloom. Um, this, you know, fe features Fudge, um, and Fudge, this, you know, there's also uh, Super Fudge and a lot of books in this series. My teacher, Miss Lichtenstein, used to read these books to us in class. And this one in particular, I remember her reading to us, I think at the end of third grade when we we're about to go into fourth grade the next year. And while I probably couldn't give you the plot play by play, because just like this book, the whole kind of world is integrated into one big story in my mind. This is, you know, uh, one of them, I remember loving it when she read it to us, and I'm sure many of you loved it when you when you were reading it. All right, and then for fifth grade, because we couldn't make up our minds, we've got two books, and so this first one is Sarah Weeks and Gita Varadarajan, and it's called Save Me a Seat. You've got uh, two. It's a two perspectives, so the authors kind of are working together to tell the story. They actually came and visited us at Scholastic a little while ago and told us what the experience was like working together. And you can see that they have their, you know, two different lunches. Um, they come from two different cultures, the two boys that are the main characters here, the fifth graders, and they, you know, and one is new to the school, but then they start to have a common problem which brings them together, which is somebody that's bullying them. So uh, I love the back here, if you can see it, it says a new friend could be sitting right next to you. And then this one, The Only Girl in School by Natalie Standiford. And so, you know, I love this because of the cover illustration. I'm a big fan of just compelling covers, even though we're not supposed to judge the book by it. But you can see this here. And then this story, the young uh, lady who's the star of the story, she is literally the only girl in her school. It's a very small uh, kind of community that's on an island. And until her friend, her best friend left, there were two girls in the school and then her friend leaves and it starts off with her writing to her friend and telling her about what it's like now to be the only girl, not just in her class, which I believe has six or seven total students, but in the entire school. And, uh, you know, it just really made me think of, I, I know out here in New, uh, the New York area, I learned about 
the people who live year-round at Fire Island and how they have a very small school for people who are year-round residents and um, you know I guess elementary school up through and I just you know that is what came to my mind when I thought about this and there's probably you know a lot of communities all around the world where this could be the case so interesting one all right so we're gonna see what question we have before we go to the next grade level and I've got for Anna Marie DeSantis any other books for second graders um, absolutely Let's see so the second grade I had pulled Ramona and her father any of the other books in the Ramona series certainly um, second grade somebody's gonna probably should be starting to look at chapter books and one of the things that I find is that um, series become really important and interesting to folks who are moving into the chapter book especially series where the book doesn't have it's the um, you could read each book independently the books don't necessarily have to be like Harry Potter where you you know kind of have to have read the first book in order to read the second book and the third book or fourth book so things like the Babysitter's Club, which I think that many of you may have read, you um, might remember that the first chapter would always kind of give you the premise and explain the basics for the world and the Babysitter's Club and how it got together. So some things like Rainbow Magic Fairies, those will kind of go over each time and set up the basics for the world. Um, there's the Candy Apple series. Um, the Whatever After series is really fun. Each one is a fractured fairy tale uh, that where the girl and her brother kind of fall into the story, mess it up a little bit, like Cinderella or Snow White or um, it's the most recent one. I know that they're up to the tenth book in the series, and I think that the super special is is coming, and I think it has to do with the Wizard of Oz. And so they kind of fall into the story and then they have to undo it. So fractured fairy tales are always fun because uh, it's something recognizable, but then the child recognizes how it's being played with and uh, how it can be set right. Um, the Puppy Place books are great. Each book features a different um, animal. So depending on reading level, that's um, maybe not as uh, kind of challenging as the Whatever After series. But those are the kind of series that I would, the are kind of stories that I think resonate early on. And if somebody is feeling challenged with chapter books, the transitional books that we have, like the Branches series, or uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid, a lot of the graphics, graphic novels, when people are around eight or nine, they really start to get into them, um, would be things that would be great for somebody who's going to be challenged by moving from, you know, pictures to just a book that's all text. So. Let's see, okay, we have another question too. From Tiffany Benyako, any recommendations for reluctant sixth grade girls? Um, definitely the graphics ones I just mentioned, and then we're gonna get to sixth grade stuff in a second. Um, let's see, let's go jump right into it then. We've got here for sixth middle school. All right, so the first one that I've got is Middle School, The Worst Years of My Life by James Patterson. All right. And the James Patterson books, um, kind of like what I was talking about with stuff for second graders, you can see that these are still illustrated novels. And so while they have pages that have all text, they also have uh, pictures and stuff like that. And um, um, there's a, I don't know the name of the author, but there's a book like My Life as a Cartoonist, My Life as a Gamer, I think it's by a woman, Janet Tardesha, I'm, mis I'm mispronouncing her last name. Those are similar in that they have some illustrations in them. It might be good. And then for seventh grade, we've got The Great Green Heist by Varian Johnson. The second book in this series uh, came out, I think, last year. And what's fun about this one is that you've got a uh, middle school election that's going on, and it's been kind of billed as the Ocean's Eleven for middle school. And so the main character here and then he's got all of his friends here and this girl that he's uh, got really a little bit of interest in, but that doesn't really play out in the book too much except that you know part of his motivation for helping with her election campaign is that he has a crush on her. And they kind of figure out ways to unrig the election. They discover that there's another kid in school who's trying to rig the election and so they're basically trying to rig things to make sure that the election goes off the way that it's supposed to. And uh, each person has a kind of talent or skill that you know plays out with the group. And 
then for eighth grade, they've got by Oleg Masola, Rude Perkovich, eighth grade Super Zero. And, and so in this one, you've got a main character who he starts off with uh, kind of like time signatures. Uh, one is one of the things that reminds me of Star Trek that I enjoy about the book and things that kind of go by very quickly and you can see something unfolding over the course of a day or a couple of days so it's a fast-paced story um, makes me think of like you know star date that kind of things that they would give in Star Wars all right so let's see if we have any questions before I go to the next one from Julie Francis at what stage grade or age do you focus more on nonfiction than fiction or do you just keep a balance with reading? That is a great question. I think that we, I'm not saying I think that, a lot of times we start off with nonfiction as people are learning concepts early on, and then when we get to reading text, it kind of, and a lot, of, I, I'm guilty of this, I have a lot of stuff here that is fiction mostly, but sometimes when you see that somebody is not responding maybe to fiction in chapter books, that is a good time to explore all of the different options that there are. And you can always, when you are reading fiction, see if you can find nonfiction to pair with it. And that is something that teachers really respond to as well, trying to figure out ways to pair fiction and nonfiction with each other. So if you're reading something that is like the Magic Treehouse series, they have the Magic Treehouse fact checkers, which go along with that. And then the Fly Guy books, which are picture books, they also have Fly Guy Presents, um, the Magic School Bus, you know, those, um, we sometimes debate here in the library if they're fiction or nonfiction. You know, you're learning a lot of stuff, and yet the bus is becoming tiny and going into the body and exploring all the systems. Um, but those have um, some books too that are also Magic School Bus Presents kind of things that are, um, kind of giving you a non-fiction take on the kind of, kind of work with the fiction stories or the tales that they tell through that. So I really at any point I would introduce non-fiction. I think that keeping them side by side is always a good idea. If somebody's really interested in a particular book and responds to a story, if they really like historical fiction, then you can go and find real life stories that go along with it and introduce those. And as some, you see somebody might be a reluctant reader looking at nonfiction, uh, fact books, stuff like the Guinness Book of World Records, magazines and newspapers, as somebody gets older so they can kind of see what's going on with current events. If somebody's interested in sports, you know, looking for books that are on different sports figures or they give you the basic, like let's say somebody's really interested in baseball and they're going to become an avid baseball fan in life, you can get them those books that kind of teach them the basics. What are the big baseball game moments in history and the big players and stuff like that, that when they are older and they're the baseball fans, they'll be able to kind of just remember off the top of their head. At some point, everybody has to develop that kind of canon of knowledge on something that they're really interested in. So um, one of my favorite fiction, nonfiction pairings, it's a little bit older, is um, Probably, I have to think about the, I can't remember the name of the nonfiction title. Also, for older kids, there are a lot of books where they do a young reader's edition of a book that has been popular for adults. And so the Hidden Figures book this year, they have a young reader's edition. And there's another one that I saw recently that's coming out. So that's something to look for. If something is really popular in um, the, you know, kind of pop culture and that adults are reading, sometimes there's a young reader's edition that you can find. Um, that will be accessible for them. All right, so let's see. Thank you, Julie Francis. All right, so now we're gonna go to high school. And for ninth, oh, let me get my sign. Okay. So for ninth grade, I haven't read this one, but we couldn't resist the title, Sleeping Freshman Never Lie by David Lubar, right? a novel. Um, on the back, it says, starting high school is never easy, but could there be a worse time for Scott's mother to announce she's pregnant? Now, one of the reasons this resonates for me in particular is because there's 14 years between me and my youngest sibling, I'm the oldest of six, and my brother was born when I was in either ninth or 10th grade. And so this, uh, the, the premise right here immediately hooked me. And then I'm very excited about this one. We have this for 10th grade. Mean Girls by Mikkel Osto, based on the screenplay by Tina Fey. 
Um, you know, if any of my st former students, now parents, <laughs> are watching on this video, you may remember me quoting this all the time. This is in uh, probably office space and things like that are things that always come into my brain when I'm, when I'm walking around. And so if you haven't seen this uh, movie, it's very easy to catch up on, but this is the story of a girl who comes into school from, for the first time she was living in Africa with her parents who were working overseas and she's encountering high school culture for the first time. She gets involved with a group of girls called the Plastics, who kind of are the lead group in the school, and uh, craziness ensues from there. I don't want to ruin it for you because it's great. And now that Scholastic has this book out, it means I can wear all my Mean Girls t-shirts to work. It's official here. And then this is also a new book that we've got out recently. It's called The Lines We Cross. It's by Randa Abdel Fattah, and uh, she also wrote the book, Does My Head Look Big In This? She's talking about a young woman, and that book was a young woman in Australia who decides to wear a head covering or hijab for the first time, and the way that kids react to her in school. And then this story, the, the voice or the narrator is a young man whose parents are kind of very vocally against immigrants, and then a young woman comes into the school who's an immigrant from Afghanistan. So it kind of moves you know, you from thinking about something in the abstract to seeing what a uh, person who's uh, actually like when you encounter that situation in your real life. And so um, we are actually gonna read this for our employee book club, so I haven't read it yet, but I have about 30 of them stacked next to my desk. I'm looking forward to that. And uh, our interns read this this summer as part of their summer internship program. Let's see, and then the last section that we've got, I've got one of my favorite reads from recently, Becoming Maria by Sonia Manzano. I brought this in for Back to School because she talks a lot about her experience going to school in the Bronx when she was in elementary and stuff, and then when she grows up, she goes to the high school for the performing arts, um, where some of you may remember from the TV show Fame, it was based on that school, um, now LaGuardia High School in New York. And her experience going from the Bronx, you know, and being in that kind of neighborhood there, and then traveling into the city and watching the entire neighborhood change, and being with kids that are coming from all different parts of the city, and have all these different art artistic interests and talents, really reminded me of my own experience coming from being out in Rockaway, which was out at the edges of New York City, and traveling in. I traveled an hour and a half to go to school every day, and I went from Rockaway, which is a tough neighborhood out on the edge, all the way to the Upper East Side of Manhattan, so it was like night and day. But um, my friends were coming from all different parts of the city too, so I, this really just, for me, it reminded me of my own high school experience. And she doesn't talk anything about being um, Maria from Sesame Street, um, till all the way towards the end, she kind of alludes to it, so this is really the backstory of you know her growing up and her experience in New York. All right, let's see, we have a question. All right, I'm going to remind you guys to ask questions, so we're right here on our last two books. So if you have anything you want to ask, go ahead and put it in the comment section. Um, this one is Disrupting Thinking, Why How We Read Matters by Kyleen Beers and Robert E. Probst. And this also is a fairly new book that we've come up with from Scholastic Professional Books. Uh, these two came and spoke to us in um, the auditorium a while ago. It really resonated with me because as a teacher, some of the stuff that they were talking about and giving advice on how to teach reading in the classroom and make it something that mattered and counted to students reminded me of my own efforts to try to get um, students engaged in reading and just shared my enthusiasm for it and stuff like that. So this book has been getting a lot of positive reaction. You can look up the hashtag, disrupting thinking and stuff like that and see some of the amazing things that people have been saying about it. And I look forward to whatever they do next because I really appreciate their theory. And then the last one I have is also from our professional group, um, Teaching Students to Conduct Research Projects by Ryan K. Gilpin. Ryan is very, very exciting reading. But you know, as a former teacher, this was something that was very important to me. And I made a choice when I was working with 10th graders that I was gonna focus on uh, teaching them how to do research and write academically so that when they got to college, 
they wouldn't be hit with that. Um, sometimes some of the college professors will feel that freshmen arrive and they're not quite ready to do research. They don't know how to do it. So I had to think to myself, you know, what's more important that we, you know, we're doing the novels or that we're doing research? And I figured out ways to manage to do both. But I think that these skills in particular are very important for students to have, um, you know, going to the library, <laughs> hint, 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 and things like that. All right, so let's see if we have any more questions. Well, if you guys have any questions as you watch this video, you want to put down in the comment section or any suggestions. We had the question earlier about books for second graders, books that are nonfiction. Um, go ahead and throw those down there and I'll see if I can come up with any additional suggestions for you. Remember that you can go to scholastic.com slash parents and the uh, Raise a Reader blog is where we're going to have the list of all of the books and you can also find some different resources and um, booklets and stuff like that that um, kind of give you ideas for books books for back to school in addition to ones we mentioned and then just you know all kind of suggestions for preparing yourself and your children for school and if you go to our facebook page you um scholastic.com no the facebook page for scholastic parents then you'll be able to find links to all of this and um, we look forward to seeing you next month thank you